Hello! Thank you for logging in and being so flexible with me having to go out of town and uh, participating in a way that we're not going to fall behind. We also have plenty of time to complete the class. Um, just so everybody is aware, I do have a student sitting here with me today. And so uh, if something isn't very clear, she is going to ask questions and ensure that this recording is going to be the best for your guys' understanding as well. Now, obviously on the bottom here, you can have pause, stop, rewind such and such forth so therefore if I do say something um, you can always go back and, and rewatch it also please feel free to write down notes questions anything uh, you can email me I will be checking my email Sunday night and Monday morning but outside of that I'm probably going to be um, out of touch okay or out of communication but we're going to jump in with chapter 7 and um, I'm going to email these as, as well as everybody should have a packet. We're going to go through chapter 7 and 8 today, and that's going to complete our studies for this week. Um, and uh, therefore, you know, let me know if I can do anything to help you out. But chapter 7 is based around the challenges of phlebotomy and what we're going to run into outside of our normal blood collection and body fluid collections. So the first thing that we want to talk about, this isn't coming out very well, can you really see it? Uh, you're just going to have to follow along on your paper because obviously this is not showing up inside of the computer screen. So if you need pause, grab your paper, uh, pull it off of online so that you can have it up while you're looking. But the first thing is, is when performing venipuncture on a children, we actually have two patients and that is the child and the parent and I'll just be honest with all y'all that working with children is is very rewarding it's very fun I love it uh, but working with parents uh, makes it a complicated situation so uh, just be aware if the parent doesn't feel comfortable if the parent has anxiety the child will most definitely have that as well okay so um, the biggest thing is is that we're going to be talking to both of them and making sure that both the child and the parent is familiar with the procedure and feels comfortable with that. Um, so this offers reassurance. We can always turn this in a game, into a game for the child. So yelling, counting, how many animals can you name, etc. Uh, touching base with different things that have come back around from when we were kids, like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, SpongeBob, if anything that you can see on their shoes, on their shirt, that you can start to build that um, relations with, uh, you can really start to um, work that in. And also rewards and bribes, of course, and I don't want you to think that this is only for children. Uh, adults enjoy rewards and bribes as well. And often the best option for collecting blood from a child is the capillary puncture or finger stick or skin stick. Remember, all of those mean the same exact thing. So where are we going to perform this capillary puncture at? In the heel of the infant. If the child is not walking, we always, always want to go to the heel. This is a must. And for your national exam, this is going to come up a couple of times and they're going to propose it as any, any child or infant that's under 12 months of age is going to have a heel stick, okay? We're going to talk a lot more about performing this heel stick and the different procedures that go into that, but you do want to remember for your national exam, the child's not walking under 12 months of age. We're going to do a heel stick every time. Now we can do the earlobe, but if you're familiar, the earlobe is a lot of cartilage, Cartilage has a really hard time bleeding. Um, one of the reasons why cartilage takes so long to heal because we don't have blood that goes through to heal that. And then of course our ring and greater finger and that's the same with adults, right? Those are the only two places that we want to stick. Now I do want to take an extra moment here to discuss capillary punctures. This is a reminder that you have a pad right on the middle of your finger and we are doing a crescent moon around that pad not on the tip tops or the sides, those are hypersensitive, 
but right inside that crescent moon. And that just ensures that we are doing the best that we can for our patients. Um, also with children, a lot of the times we have special lancets that are not gonna puncture as deep. And with that said, I do wanna plant another seed on your national exam. They're gonna tell you that you cannot use a lancet greater than two mm's for any type of child or infant puncture, okay? So just remember that two mm's is the max that we can use. And truly, we don't wanna hit the bone. If we put a lancet in too far and we hit somebody's bone, the heel bone, the finger bone, it's going to cause infection, it's going to cause multiple complications, and so we do not want to do that. We want to avoid that. Um, if you are using an adult sized lancet, like a one and a half millimeter on a child and you're doing a capillary puncture, you do want to kind of push that to an angle so that when you puncture, it's not puncturing straight down, it's puncturing at an angle. And also, why we're on this subject, most, well, everybody uh, has these swirls on their fingers. If we can, we want to cut those swirls um, against the swirls. That will increase the bleeding. And we all know from doing the capillary containers how fun it is to try and fill those. Uh, so, and the same things apply as well when you're working with children, we want to warm the hand, we want to make sure that we're kind of massaging and milking prior to even doing the stick. Okay, so a puncture site must be warm. Uh, this increases blood flow up to seven times, okay? Ideal temperature is 42 degrees Celsius and site should be cleansed with alcohol. Alcohol is our number one antiseptic. And if you remember, how we can ensure that the antiseptic is working is by allowing it to dry. Don't wave over it, don't blow on it. This cross contaminates our um, cleansely site or our sterile site. So we wanna use or avoid the use of iodine-based solutions. This causes an elevation in potassium. Now I wanna stop here for a quick second because you will see this again on your national exam. Anytime we use iodine, betadine, it will elevate potassium. You are going to get this question once or twice on your national exam, so just kind of pack that away, remember that. So after we puncture, right, we wipe away the first drop of blood, um, but also remember, before we even wipe away the first drop of blood, we're dropping the lancet into our sharps container. That's essential and crucial. And I'll just let you guys know, when I was going through my national exam, that came up and said, what's the most critical point of a capillary puncture? And I was like, oh, I got this. Wiping away the first drop. Well, luckily for me, uh, A, B, C, D did not have to wipe away the first drop. So I went back and I reread the question, reread the question until I figured out they're referring to the lancet. The lancet must go in the sharps container. And then after teaching this class for um, the last year or so, I realized that a lot of people are throwing lancets away in the trash can. So your national exam wants to highlight that lancets must go in the puncture, the sharps uh, containers as well, okay? Now the reason why we wipe away the first drop is because it's contaminated with interstitial fluid and epithelial tissues. Uh, basically skin tissues and that fluid in between uh, your, your tissues. So every time, no matter what, you'll work out in the field, you'll see tons of people who don't wipe away the first drop. That doesn't mean it's a good practice. That means you know better and continue to do the things that you do, okay? Um, we obviously know what happens if we send contaminated specimens down to the lab. Um, we always get them uh, sent back to us. We're always put in question. And uh, as lobotomists here, we want to make sure we do the best job every time. So blood should flow freely into the collection container. And we've talked about this. Uh, if you scrape the container against your uh, finger, you're going to be rupturing those red blood cells causing hemolysis. And um, remember, if you get a sample that is bright, bright red, chances are you've hemolysized that. Okay, but the lab will definitely send that back and we'll have you redo it. Since we're talking about that, another way that you can cause hemolysis inside of a capillary puncture is when you're pushing hard down right next to the puncture. The rule of thumb is, is you can milk your finger up to the first knuckle. 
but after that, you're running the risk of popping those red blood cells before they come out. Okay, this just talks about how we want to gently massage the finger. We want to keep that warmed up. Uh, this particular patient here is elderly. As uh, elderly patients get older, they do have a lack of circulation and that can be imperative to a successful capillary function. So always we clean the site. Um, this lancet has a safety clip. The ones that we're using here in class have the automatic retract. There are also ones that don't retract and don't have a safety. They literally just stay out, so you need to be very careful with those. That's where it's imperative that once we uh, perform the puncture, we drop it into the sharps immediately. We also do not want to touch the blade slot end or even the end where the retractable has been. Okay, like I was referring to before, we position that to puncture across the fingertip lines. We depress the plunger, and uh, you know, the sooner you can do this, the better off you are for your patient. If you can have a little bit of uh, pressure on the finger, it helps take away from the sting of the actual poke. We remove the lancet, gently wipe away the first droplet of blood. And we need to allow the blood to flow into the container. Now, if you forget, what happens a lot of the times is that the blood's going to start running and it'll create almost like a river. And so you'll end up chasing this river of blood all the way down their finger. Just wipe it back up and restart here. And you can always hold it down so that the blood will run to the tip of the finger. Now, this is very important. Our order of draw changes here. So our typical order of draw is yellow, blue, red, green, lavender, and gray. Now I want to show you a little trick here, and I'm hoping, I don't know if they can see that. Let me do that a little bit bigger. So we have yellow, blue, red, green, lavender, and gray. Okay, that's a little bit better. But basically, we're going to start at lavender. This is going to be our number one draw. And then we're going to go green and red. So the capillary draw is lavender, green, and red. Okay. Now, they all contain the same exact anticoagulants. That doesn't change. Lavender is still EDTA. Green is still heparin. Red will generally be nothing at all. It will just have the clot activator, if anything. But in the micro collection tubes, we don't bother spinning them down a lot of the times, and so we don't have that nice little separator gel inside of them. Okay, now I'm sure you're wondering, why do we change the order? Well, if you remember, we did the original order based on strength of the anticoagulant and what will cross contaminate. When we're looking at capillaries, what's the number one thing that happens with the capillary? Starts the clot. So we start then with lavender, which is one of our weakest coagulations, um, and then we go to the stronger anticoagulant, and then we finish with something that's gonna allow the blood to clot anyways. So that's why the order changes. It allows for better collection and better testing. Okay. Um, like I was just referring to, this uh, says the red top has non-additive for the micro containers. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. With the order of draw, sorry. Mm -hmm. With the blood vest, so if we had an order to take an ABV, we would do it first? Mm, yes. So we would actually still have to stick the patient twice. Mm -hmm. But one would be capillary, ABG would be in the wrist. Oh. Mm -hmm. Very good. So talking about the heel sticks, blood should be collected from most medial or lateral portions of the plantar surface of the heel. And so if you want to turn to page 243, it will show you. And essentially we follow the line from the middle of the big toe to the heel, and then from the line from the, uh, what would be considered the ring uh, toe down to the heel, and it kind of creates that V. And you can see that there on 243. 
Um, and anytime that you are lost or don't have any idea, just go back to this and remember middle of the big toe, ring finger, okay? Or uh, ring toe, excuse me. Now, the depth of the puncture should be no greater than two millimeters. So once again, we're seeing that no greater than the two millimeters. Ooh, I hope this is still recording. Okay, well hopefully it recorded through all that. Sorry y'all if it was still recording me logging back in there. Um, so once again, the two millimeters, this is very important for your national exam. Remember that, write it down. Um, and more shallow for our premature infants. This is also another thing that you're gonna see on your national exam. Excessive crying can result in elevated white blood cell counts. So we have to wait 60 minutes after any major procedure so that we can allow the, the infant, the baby to calm down and all the blood cells to return to their normal level. Um, they will propose this to you in a multitude of faucets. They will tell you um, basically that you have all these different things that you need to draw on this baby and you need to do with this baby. Which one do you do first? You're gonna do all non-invasive procedures first to avoid making the baby cry. And then we go into our sticks and collecting the blood. Um, some, a lot of the times the baby won't cry and that's wonderful, but we always wanna keep in the back of our mind that it is possible for them to cry. And the more hysteric they get in their cry, the more elevated their white blood cell count will be. Okay. Um, and just to accent just a little bit further, uh, there is a thing called O2 stats. And if you've ever been to the emergency room or anything, you've had this, they, they stick it on your finger and within three to five seconds, they know where your O2 stats are at. That's what they're gonna propose to you inside of the question with the babies is, you know, you have an O2 stat, a, a CVC, uh, you have all these multiple tests that you need to, to run, which one do you do first? Your O2 stat because it's non-invasive. Okay. So for heel sticks, we generally want to warm the heel. Uh, a lot of the times babies are already wrapped up and warm, so um, this may or may not be a crucial uh, step in that. I have talked with many uh, phlebotomists, long year phlebotomists that say they never really did that. Um, but obviously, if the child's foot is cold, we do want to warm that up. Um, so we want to clean the incision pad or site with alcohol, and we allow that to air dry, just like we were doing a finger stick. We remove the lancet from the package. Once again, just like when we're doing a vena puncture, anything we do, we want to show the parents, we want to show everybody that the equipment is sterile and it's right there. It's never been used before. Now you position the heel stick lancet on the medial or lateral portion of the plantar surface. And the plantar surface is just a fancy way of saying the heel. We depress the plunger, um, line from in between the fourth and fifth toes to the heel is the preferred method. So once again, we're just drawing a line here and a line there to ensure that we miss any major nerves and arteries. Uh, we have found through science that if we don't do this, we could actually impair the child from learning how to walk. So after triggering, we remove the lancet and discard in the sharps container, just like everything. Sharps go to sharps containers immediately. We take care not to make direct contact with the collection container filled to the desired level. Okay, and most of the time it's that second line on there, um, on the, the micro container. Now, hemolysis is the number one reason why these labs are rejected. 
So basically, here are the causes of hemolysis. Alcohol was not dry when, the, when it was actually punctured. Alcohol will continue to rupture those red blood cells. Finger or heel was squeezed too vigorously and over that first knuckle and with a heel too close to the actual puncture site. Newborn infants have increased red cell fragility and high red blood cell volume. Blood was scraped off instead of flowing into the micro collection container. Now, anticoagulated patients. This is another complication that we will run into. If our patient's on Coumadin, Warfarin, uh, a regimen of aspirin, anything like that that is thinning the blood, and a lot of the times your patients will know this if you do ask them if they're on blood thinners versus looking for um, anything else, but uh, they have a tendency to bleed and have larger hematomas. So we want to contain the bleeding after the venipuncture site with gauze or cotton balls and with our Coban uh, elastic bandage. And if you guys don't remember, anytime we're facing this, we want to double up on the gauze. When we go around, we want to twist the bandage over the puncture site so it continues to put pressure on there. Now with these particular patients, we don't want them to leave our office quite yet. We want them to sit and hang out for about 15 minutes and ensure that that site has stopped bleeding. We also want to instruct our patients not to carry their purse or other heavy items with the venipuncture arm for at least one hour. Now depending on if they're elderly, whatever the case might be, you want to tell them one hour to the rest of the day. Now, elastic bandage, or otherwise referred to as Coban, cohesive bandage, uh, we want to place over that gauze pad, and uh, that will continue to put pressure on that puncture site. Then we have the resistant patient. This may take more time to convince than collection is necessary. Um, so basically, we've talked about this. If somebody's refusing, they have the right to. That's their right. But we want to educate them. We want to help them to understand why we're taking the blood. And always, of course, if they resist further than that, um, we will get the nurse involved and then have them sign a refusal. Um, with psychiatric patients, they might not always know what's going on. Involving their nurse that they trust can be beneficial for you. The biggest thing to remember with psych patients is they have a tendency to hurt themselves. So we only want to bring in the necessary equipment to perform the actual procedure. Uh, it's, it's amazing how psych patients can have really fast hands. Um, they will still steal things from you and you won't even know it. So it's just really important that you count everything that you're taking in there and you remove everything that you've brought into that patient's room. Um, a lot of the times it makes people feel even more comfortable just to write it down, even trash everything, just bring it all out of the psych patient's room. Question? Yes. Even though he's a psych patient, we, can we restrain him or no? Um, so restraint is a completely different ball game. Um, restraint you have to have a physician's order most of the time um, and so we try not to restrain the patient at all. Um, there was even this point in time where they said all four uh, bed rails up was a considered a, a type of restraint and so um, we try not to restrain them. Obviously if a parent is involved the parent can help with restraining so that's always an option for us. Okay, obese patients, veins are usually deeper and not as easy to feel. Uh, fat globules often mimic veins, but if you are practicing palpation correctly and you try and trace where that fat globule is going, it won't go anywhere. And you'll soon realize that that is just a flat glo fat globule, it is not a vein. Um, vein in the hand may be easier to access, and also the veins in the wrist may be easier to access. Um, it's, 
it's sad what I see a lot of the hard stick team do with obese patients in particular is they will take a butterfly needle because you get a flash and they'll just go in and, and unfortunately go fishing for that median cubital. I of course do not encourage anybody to do that. Um, you definitely want to know where you're going before you insert the needle. Okay, patients in isolation, you must wear extra protection while drawing the sample. And we've talked about this before, if you have to gown up, glove up, if you have to wear um, you know, boots on your shoes, if you have to do all these things, the important thing to remember is that you take all this stuff off before you leave the room. Um, and you do it in the fashion where you are not exposing yourself to anything that is on your isolation um, PPE, personal protective equipment. Um, make sure that you're following uh, policies and procedures for the facility that you work at. Patients with damaged or collapsing veins. Veins may be inaccessible due to burns, scars, or surgical procedures. You must use a finger stick or alternative veins. Collapsing veins require the use of syringe and butterfly or small evacuated tubes. Now, I want to preface that this, you can actually use a syringe with a butterfly. So instead of hooking up the actual evacuated tubes, you spin on the actual syringe and then you're capable of even controlling how hard we're pulling out with that. So kind of a double feature there and it works very nice. Now I always get the question, how do I tell a collapsing vein? How am I supposed to know this before I stick a needle in it? And once again we go back to our technique of palpating and if you palpate or you push down and it's not elastic and it takes a while for it to fill back up we know we're dealing with collapsing veins at that point in time. Okay. Perfect! So that takes us to the end of chapter 7. Now I want you guys to all do the questions at the end of chapter 7 um, and we will definitely review all of that together as warm-ups on the next day of class. Um, but I do want to go over critical thinking with y'all. Um, so on page 257, number one says you open a cleaning pad and clean an infant's heel to do a heel stick and realize that you've just cleaned it with a betadine solution and not alcohol. What will be the result if a blood sample is collected? And that goes back to what do we see an increase in? Yeah. Potassium, very good. Okay, and, and like I said, you're going to see this again on your national exam, so really tuck that away, that's fantastic. The proper procedure is to wipe away the first drop of blood when doing a finger or heel puncture. What is the effect of the test result if the first drop is used? And it's contaminated, it has interstitial fluid, we have ruptured blood cells, uh, hemolyzed blood cells. We also um, will see uh, epithelial cells inside of there, and they're very huge. It will skew all of our tests. So we will have improper lab results. We'll end up doing the whole procedure all over again. Okay. All right, now we are going to go to chapter eight. And remember, there are questions here at the bottom of chapter seven that I do want you to go ahead and answer as well with the questions in the back of chapter seven. So let's go to chapter eight now. All right, in this chapter we're going to focus specifically on pediatrics, that wonderful uh, child and really we consider infants from born to 12 months and then children or pediatrics from there to about teenage years. We do have preteens, that type of thing. We'll talk a little bit about that inside this chapter. Um, but this is very important. A child who is sick is not a sick child. This goes back to parenting. When your kid does something bad, it doesn't make them a bad child. They just made a bad choice. Uh, very similar in that fashion. We never want to make a child feel as though they are a sick child. Um, it has psychological damaging um, 
tendencies and it makes for healing and trust a lot harder to be built. So um, you'll be caring for both patient and, and parent, like we said before. And we want to make sure that we definitely get the parents buy-in, um, otherwise the child will really feel apprehensive towards us. So child will read anxiety of the parent. The parent is anxious. Ask if they would be more comfortable leaving the room. Um, you know, this does happen at a certain age. When we get into that preteens, they're dying for independence. They're begging for their own time. And so a lot of the times if you have an 11, 12, 13 year old uh, that's kind of thrown attitude all the way around, you can ask if the, um, the parent would step out and you'd be surprised at how willing they are to work with you when the parent's not there. Um, but we do have to respect the parent's wishes. They are the guardian. If they don't feel comfortable leaving the room, um, then that's, that's perfectly fine. If the child doesn't feel comfortable with them leaving the room, we of course want to encourage them to have the most comfortable uh, situation possible. Now, keys to caring while performing a, phlebot a pediatric phlebotomy. Phlebotomists must be calm and confident. Get down to a child's level. A lot of the times, just sitting on the doctor's rolly chair and looking at them face to face or even giving them an opportunity to be a little bit higher than you allows them to feel more comfortable. You want to explain every step of the proce procedure. And a lot of the times, if we have a toy bear, or something um, that's there in the office to use, we want to demonstrate on that stuffed animal or Raggedy Ann doll or whatever it is, and then kind of play with them and of course encourage the child to play with them and to ask questions through that so it's a little bit more based on their level. Now, we do have to take a moment to look at the psychology of how a child views uh, being ill and basically up to two years of age they just have a very limited understanding um, they don't grasp a lot of the concepts and they don't really understand they just know they feel bad and so what we're doing is trying to help them feel better two to six years of age may view illness as a punishment and there's many misconceptions and fantasies around this. And I can speak directly into this. My daughter, a few years ago, came to me and said, Dad, I'm, I don't know what I did wrong. I don't know why I keep getting sick. And so we, we did have a conversation about what causes sickness, what causes that ailment, and that it's nothing that she has made bad choices or she's being punished. And so I know this to be absolutely true inside of this age range. And a lot of the times, um, I love talking with my daughter about how she views things. She used to tell me that she felt like she had a war going on inside of her. Um, my oldest child, when he was this age, he used to tell me that um, there, were, there was a video game that was happening inside of his body and um, you know people were fighting and different things and so um, this can be very true and, and this gives us an opportunity to talk into this. Um, there's a great technique uh, for communication called mirroring. It works very well with children. And that's when they tell you something, you just repeat what they just said. You say, okay, so if I understand this correctly, what, you're, what you see happening is this. And then they say, oh, yes, that's exactly it. Or they say, no, I meant this. And that makes you key in a little bit closer to that. And then once you start really continuing that dialogue, it gives you an opportunity to explain what's happening on their level inside their terminology. Now as the child gets older, six to nine years of age, we have a better understanding of illness, can understand how pre procedures will actually help cure illnesses. They can put together that we're actually looking at what's happening inside their body and depending on what that shows the doctor, they know what medication to help them become or get better or back to uh, running around. Age 10 and above, fairly clear understanding of illness. They actually can start to grasp the concepts of microorganisms and where this illness is actually coming from. 
uh, they really start to understand how it's spread and how this can go. My, my oldest son is 11 at this point in time and he tells me all the time how he is encouraging his friends to wash their hands better and do different things because he's really starting to understand that whole process. Now, reactions to pain. We, uh, a lot of us have a motherly instinct and a deep compassion for children. And so um, we want to avoid telling them that it won't hurt. Um, we know a lot of the times in life things are going to be a little bit more difficult and sugarcoating it is not going to make it easier for the child. So children will react differently depending on the age, depending on if they are quote unquote sheltered. Um, we even have children who are active that go out and they crash their bikes and they they fall on their rollerblades or they um, play basketball and they take a couple elbows and when they get a uh, stick they tend to think oh I thought that was a lot worse but then you do have the children who don't go out and play and they do play more video games and they do stay inside more and they haven't been exposed to a lot of the pain threshold and so therefore a stick is going to be one of the worst pains they've felt so far. So um, obviously as a phlebotomist we're not going to have a deep conversation about their daily life um, but I want you to have that in the back of your mind that you may have done the best that you could have it was just the exposure that that child has had to the pain threshold. So infants a lot of the times will rely on caregivers to notice the pain. So if mom, dad, people don't freak out, a lot of times the infants aren't even going to realize anything happened and um, that's always a blessing. Toddlers experience pain but cannot always locate the source. Um, I, I know this is true with my youngest, he talks about this a lot. Uh, he's not sure where it's happening, he just knows he's not right. And he knows that it's not um, something that he wants to continue to deal with and he wants us to fix it for him. School age children can locate pain in terms of body parts. Once again, if you have a Raggedy Ann doll or if you have a teddy bear, a lot of the times you can ask them to point to where it's hurting, where it started hurting, um, what would simulate the same pain on that bear. Uh, you know, children are really good to say burning, stabbing, uh, stinging. They're, they're really good with these terms because they mean they're, they're very true with their statements. So we can manage this pain. We have topical anesthetics that can be used to numb the site. The disadvantage of this is it takes about 30 minutes to fully numb the area. And sometimes the anxiety that the child is feeling is just gonna be so increased by waiting this long that it can cause uh, more complications than if you just go ahead and do the procedure. Um, I know this is gonna sound a little bit oxymoronic, but we have what's called a cool spray or a cold spray and we can spray it on their arm and it will numb it temporarily and then we can go ahead and perform our venipuncture and that does help displace the pain quite a bit and I've heard a lot more of that cold spray being used more than this topical anesthetic. Uh, it doesn't state it here but the other disadvantage to a topical anesthetic is that it's pricey um, and a lot of the times we're going to be billing the insurance company to pay for that. Um, another thing is, is that with those topical anesthetics there's a lot of different medications that go into that to balance it and we don't know if that child is allergic or not and so we can have other complications that come out of that. But I do want to accent that really fast. I, I did have a friend who told me that they would come into the waiting room and they would apply that antiseptic um, to, our, to all of the children and uh, allow that to kind of sit in and then just take them back one at a time and um, it always kind of helped. Uh, distractions are the biggest thing. We have done so many tests with placebos and if you're not familiar with what a placebo is, but a placebo is a fake pill. It's something that has absolutely no medicinal properties in it. Uh, but yet psychologically when you give people placebos, they feel better, they do better. So. Um, Sometimes I would say, well, I know a trick. 
and I'm going to do this and it should help out with the pain but you're still going to feel a little bit of a pinch and so it's also a way for the child to communicate back. Well Josh that didn't help or oh thank you that that was a lot a lot better than I thought um, but it gives them a point of still being in control. So distraction is moving the child's attention from the procedure to something else and I gotta tell you, this works great for adults. Fantastic as well as children. Like I was referring to before, you see a child with light up shoes. Uh, one of my favorite things to comment on. I used to always tell them when they grow up, will they make uh, light up shoes for adults because I miss having my light up shoes. And you can generally get a smile out of a child and, and the child will start interacting with you a little bit more that way. And even though we're talking about children, I do want to take a moment to say that this works great with adults as well. So um, if you notice a, a beautiful wedding ring on uh, somebody's hand, you can ask them, you know, how long have you been married? Uh, how was your honeymoon? Where did you have your wedding at? And when people get locked into telling these stories, they have a tendency to completely block out everything you're doing. And then the procedure's done, they're walking out, and um, they have appreciated the whole experience. So don't ever be afraid to kind of uh, ask those questions. But the key to this, whether it be an adult or a child, is that you're genuinely interested. Don't ask somebody a question about something you really don't care about. It's, it's going to be flat and they're going to know it immediately. Uh, pick something that actually interests you. Pick something that you can kind of expand on. I, I've seen other people attempt to do this and not be particularly uh, excited or even interested in what they just brought up and it, it's kind of plain as day and it kind of has a reverse effect and then your report isn't so being built it's kind of torn down. But locating veins, we know palpating is our number one thing. We're looking for the direction the vein is going, the sponginess inside the vein, the width of the vein, and the depth of the vein. That way we can visualize puncturing that vein before we go in. Um, and we know what angle to take, we know what direction to place the needle at, and the actual um, width or, or depth, so we can place that needle in the middle of that vein. But these are becoming more and more frequent. I hear more and more stories of them pulling out vein locators, and I believe that here over the next five to 10 years, we'll see these more and more common. Um, of course, with all new technology, when it first comes out, it's very expensive. As it starts to kind of lower, then we'll be able to see it more and more. But one, one of these vein finders uses high intensity light um, to locate the veins. And then the other one uses a near infrared imaging that can also display veins on a monitor and we can literally see when we are entering into the veins. So it's kind of neat and they kind of look like a taser in a way. They kind of go over and they hover over and we can see. This is a small dorsal hand vein. And this is performed on children less than two years of age that are probably starting to walk and crawl. And so we don't want to necessarily do a heel puncture. And so basically we hold their hand and a lot of the times you can see it. Um, I don't know if I can show it here if it'll come up, but I actually have a scar from when they did that to me when I was a little bit younger. Um, and they can go right in there. It's generally a really easy vein to hit. Of course, we want to use a very high numbered gauge so that we are not um, creating any other issues for the infant. Now, if we can get the parents to buy in and assist, we want them to. They can hold the child on their lap. They can provide restraints so the child does not move. They can help out by showing that it's okay by participating. Now, restraint of the child, we generally use a blanket to restrain them, um, but effective way to restrain small, or is a less threatening and effective way to restrain a small child. Um, we do use these boards that we can strap an infant to. Um, it's few and far between. Generally, the blanket will be just fine. 
So how to work effectively with children and families. Smile and be friendly, okay? Introduce yourself and explain the role. Don't be afraid to be animated and have some fun. Be aware of their facial expressions and body language. You can tell a lot from somebody's nervous tapping or moving of their foot. And also when you say something, you can really key into the level of understanding by their facial expressions. Keep your voice soft and pleasant. And like we said before, get down to the child's level. We want to talk to the child and we want to use simple words. We don't want to use terms like phlebitis and hematoma and different things like that. It's just not appropriate. We want to avoid teasing. I know there is a handful of people out there that think that teasing is fun, um, but when you're a child, it's not very fun. And if they don't know you, it's definitely not fun. And um, it's really not a good way to start to uh, build rapport with a child. And I don't know if you guys have one, but I have an uncle who always thought it was fun to tease me. Um, I still don't like the guy to this day. So if you do not know an answer, simply say, I don't know. Once again, be honest about the pain. You're going to feel a little sharp sting here, like a little pinch. Um, if that sibling says your sister brother pinched you before, that's pretty much what this is going to feel like, a little pinch. Avoid separating parents and child unless you have to. We want to encourage the child. This goes back to that screaming game. Um, this is something that I've seen done multiple times. You can ask a child, how loud can you scream? I bet you I can scream louder than you and you have a screaming contest and you have these fun little things. It is kind of nice though to sneak back into the waiting room and let everybody know you're just playing a screaming game and the child wasn't being tortured. But you can encourage the child in multiple different ways. You can tell them you know, that they'll get a sucker, they'll get stickers, different things like that. Um, you can also tell them that they've been a very good patient and that you were so impressed with how they have acted. Um, that kind of empowering, encouraging aspect makes it easier for the next time they come in. Children need the most love when they are least lovable. This is very true. Um, so even though they're acting out, they're acting out for a reason. They definitely want your compassion and it's important that you can continue to be professional on that level. Encourage and utilize play. Check doll or teddy bear first. Um, you can always have a dialogue with your teddy bear or the doll. Um, you can always sit down and kind of have fun with them. You know, did you see the last episode of Ricky Dicky and Dawn? Um, have you seen this? Um, and then you kind of look over, oh, sorry, we've got work to do today and different fun things as, and just continue that play. Perfect. So this brings us to the end of chapter eight. Um, basically, um, I do want you all to think to yourself, and we'll, we'll have this discussion on the first day when you come back, about how you'll interact with pediatrics. Um, do you have any past experiences with children? Best practices to perform with children? That, and we'll, we'll kind of talk a little bit more about this and go into this a little bit deeper. Um, but I want you guys all to be thinking about this right now. If you can possibly even um, maybe write down a couple notes or things to share. Uh, like I said, the, the best practices that I've found is to be animated, to be fun, not to make it this you know, robotic thing and to always involve their parents. If you can make their parent laugh, chances are the child's gonna start laughing shortly afterwards. All right, so please complete the questions here. There's not too many, and there's not too many at the end of chapter eight. It's just not a very big chapter. Chapter nine is very important. If you guys want to start reading ahead, that would be who of you. Um, we are going to cover a lot of little things inside of chapter nine. The um, critical thinking question for chapter eight 
A 12-year-old boy sits in the phlebotomy chair and starts screaming that he does not want his blood drawn. The parents are in the room with you and observe the child. There are multiple patients in the waiting room hearing the screaming of the child. Luckily, you have several other phlebotomists at this location. How do you handle this situation? Well, of course, we want to get buy-in as much as we can. If the parents will buy in, we want them to help. We want them to help calm down the child. This particular scenario, I think they're proposing that the parents are actually part of the issue. And so, of course, we want one of the other phlebotomists to go tell everybody in the waiting room that um, we haven't even started the procedure yet. The child is just um, getting settled in. And then we also want to ask and see if the parents would like to participate or go sit back out in the lobby. And then we can have other phlebotomists come in. Sometimes it's just finding that phlebotomist that can connect to that child, um, that can really talk to them, and then we can continue that procedure. Um, so there's a multitude of different things that we can do to handle the situation. Obviously, if worse comes to worst, we ask the, ch the parents to restrain the child for us. We do our best, quickest draw possible and then move on, okay? All right, well, hopefully you have enjoyed going over these two chapters with me. I uh, definitely look forward to seeing everybody in class at our next meeting date and we will be starting chapter nine. I'm not sure that we'll get all the way through chapter nine. There's a lot of really good nuggets that we need to focus on and make sure that you remember for your national exam. Um, but I hope everybody's staying safe and has a wonderful weekend.